Welcome to the ICU podcast, where we explore the vestibular experience through conversations between patients and the health professionals who care for them. During this podcast, we invite patients to share their stories and healthcare professionals to ask questions so they are equipped to better care for and truly see the invisible challenges faced by their patients. I'm Kimberly Warner. And I'm Cynthia Ryan. And we are your hosts on this journey of discovery. Welcome everyone to our next episode of the ICU podcast. I am really looking forward to today's discussion where we explore vestibular rehabilitation, what works and what doesn't. Um, Vestibular rehab therapy or VRT is a specialized form of exercise-based therapy designed to alleviate both primary and secondary symptoms of vestibular disorders. As many of you know, VRT uses specific head, body, and eye exercises to design designed to retrain the brain to recognize and process signals from the inner ear and coordinate them with information um, from our eyes and our muscles. Physical therapists are challenged with creating a customized therapy plan for each patient. But while VRT is an evidence, evidence-based approach for treating many types of vestibular problems, it is not always the miracle cure many patients are hoping for. We have two wonderful guests with us today, and like always, one is a patient and one is a healthcare professional. I'm going to introduce our patient today, Ashley Chin. Hi, Ashley. Hey. She is a former emergency RN from Greenville, South Carolina, who retired her nursing career and turned to baking after many medical issues, including vestibular migraine and PPPD. She enjoys being in the kitchen, crafting, and doing anything she calls quote unquote nerdy, including (laughs) watching Disney, Star Wars, and playing board games. She and her husband have been married for almost five years and have a sweet wire fox terrier puppy named Luna. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Ashley. We have so much in common, the baking and the, uh, the nerdy stuff. (laughs) I'm a a big nerd, man. It's a... at first, when I was younger, it was like, oh, do I really want to be? But now it's like, oh, wait, I found my people. Like, it's yeah, kind of- <laughs> embrace it. <laughs> I totally I totally get that. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to welcome our next guest, Matt Whitaker, who is a physical therapist with over 20 years of experience. Yeah. In 1998, he earned his degree from Loma Linda University, where he co-founded the vestibular rehab program for outpatient neurological clinic. And he also is a guest lecturer and vestibular instructor for doctoral physical therapy students and neurology residents. For the first decade of Matt's career, he treated patients with neurological conditions, working in all settings, including acute and ICU care, inpatient rehab, home health, and skilled nursing. Over the past 15 years, he's focused on orthopedic care, but remains passionate about helping patients with vestibular issues. Today, Matt is the co-founder of Evolve Physical Therapy, a clinic with two locations in the Portland, Oregon metro area, which is where Vita is headquartered, and uh, he where he lives with his family. So welcome, Matt. Thank welcome, you, Cynthia. Matt. Thank you, Kimberly. And side note, Matt actually treated me. <laughs> uh, we worked together for a good, gosh, Matt, six or seven months, and he did some really, we didn't do VRT. We did more cervicogenic work together, but he's an right. excellent PT. So I'm here right. to plug that. That was a privilege. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was you know, I, I, I saw, Kimberly, your, your article on Veda's website. And, and when I first saw it, I thought, man, I wonder what she has done. I wonder what, because you had quite a, quite a journey there. And so one day yeah. for you to pop up in my waiting room, I walked out and I said, I thought, I know this person, but I don't know yeah. this person. So that was kind of a nice surprise. <laughs> Like, I I think I need to help this person. (laughs) Maybe, maybe. So (laughs) good to meet you, Ashley. It is nice to meet you too, Matt. Ashley, actually, let's start with you. Um, Let's hear a little bit about briefly, I know it's a long journey for many of us, but briefly describe the onset of your vestibular symptoms so we can all learn about that a little bit. Yeah. So my first vestibular symptoms um was really just vertigo um was actually the day of my wedding i was i got married and 
we got married in Beaufort, South Carolina. It was, it was hot. It's in October. So it's, it's like, you know, it's a little humid. And, um, I remember sitting down and just being like really off, like feeling like the world could like really start spinning. And I was like, Mail, I'm in this giant dress. It's hot. There's stress. Like I, it's, it's fine. Just give me some water. And thankfully, like after that, I was fine. Um, and then I ended up flying home to California because at the time that's where I was living with my husband and I was supposed to go back to work. Um, and I called out one day cause I just didn't feel right. And then the next day I went to work and you know, a busy ER night shift nurse just running around. And all of a sudden I'm talking to a patient, he and his wife are sitting there and the world just like my world just started spinning. And I had to like grab onto his bed rail and I put myself like sat on the ground and I called for help on my radio. And that was the start, really. That was like my big start. And at that point, they, the ER, they put me in an ER bed to make sure I was okay. Um, and the doctor ended up telling me I had labyrinthitis. And so that was like my first diagnosis because we all mm-hmm. go through probably a couple before we find the, the right one. So, yeah. um, so that was the start. And then, um, throughout all that, I went back to work as a nurse after I completed one cycle of VRT, um, mm. with Jimmy, he was great out in California. Um, he was a big Disney nerd too. So we got along and then <laughs> after, unfortunately after that, um, I got COVID, um, in December of 2019, right before everything happened and it basically kind of they think it reactivated what was happening um and they think it hit my inner ear and my eyes and so after that i struggled a lot and i now have vm and pppd and then i have some eye issues as well i go see a vision therapist once a week so. Wow. Let me just um, clarify. So the VRT that you got prescribed, was that because they thought you had labyrinthitis and that was, so, so that happened pretty immediately after that initial diagnosis? You know, that's a really great question. Cause I totally even forgot. So, <laughs> because everything's happened so much. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I originally went to the ENT and the ENT said, Hey, like, I hate to tell you this, but you're like fitting this category for VM. It, but, you know, it could not be, but I want you to go see, he prescribed PT for me. He said, go see this, uh, the doctor. Um, and so we started that and they originally thought I had a little bit of BPPV. So they treated me for that. Um, but that's never happened again. So we're not fully sure if that was actually a thing, but then we did VRT after that. And then I saw the neurologist. And then we started meds and everything. But the ENT was honestly the first person who was like, no, I think you have VM. You fit the genetic profile, like the young 20, mid 20s white woman hmm. is he's like, I'm sorry, but that's that's where you are. So. <laughs> <laughs> and for those who are listening who aren't used to all of our acronyms, which we love, um, VM is vestibular migraine. Um, VRT is vestibular rehabilitation therapy. Those are two that we'll use a lot. BPPV, people do often know about by its um, abbreviation, but it's benign paroxysmal positional vertigo where the crystals in the inner ear are out of place. And then PPPD or triple PD, they're just so so many <laughs> acronyms, <laughs> is a, a perceptual, a postural, perceptual, Persistent. Help me with this, Matt. Persistent. Yep. Actually, persistent. That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Persistent pers- po- postural perceptual dizziness. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Mouthful. Say that three, three times fast. <laughs> yeah. That's why they call it 3PD. Right? Yeah, exactly. But just wanted to make sure for people who don't yeah. know all of all of those acronyms. Um, anyway, so, um, so Matt, tell us what the typical intake for a possible vestibular patient, somebody who comes in with, you know, dizziness or vertigo um, and is likely having something that is vestibular going on. What, when they come into a physical therapy office, what does their intake look like? How do you evaluate them to determine maybe, is it vestibular or not? Is it um, inner ear or central? 
mm-hmm. uh, and then what what you do with them afterwards or who else you might refer them to. Right. I, well, I think, you know, Ashley's story is very illustrated, illustrative of the fact that you can't necessarily go straight with the diagnosis that was given and orient your your history and your testing around what's written on the paper. Um, you know, I would be curious as to, as to whether or not it was established that you truly had a labyrinthitis and if it was, if it was something else, right? Um, so in that, in that vein, listening is the key. I really, I really believe in that sincerely because uh, knowing the, the course and the journey that people take to come see us, it's usually with an event like she had, she ends up in the ER if you happen to be there that day. Uh, mm-hmm. You probably had some testing done you were probably in a waiting period to see the ENT. Maybe you got to see a neurologist somewhere in there. You probably had an MRI um, and mm-hmm. you go through all these hoops. And when patients come to us, we have the luxury of time. Uh, and, and most clinics, you're going to get at least 30 minutes with the provider. Um, we do it at 45 minutes to an hour. And I had a Meniere's patient a couple of weeks ago. We spent almost the full hour taking a history. And, and part of that is cathartic, I think, for the patient uh, and to be able to establish a good therapeutic alliance where you're not um, telling, but you're, you're listening. Um, mm-hmm. And you can then start to ask questions around that story and around those specifics to that patient that can clue you in better as to what you actually need to test and to treat. Um, and so that process might be a couple of visits in duration just to get that history and then move in the direction of testing. Um, the other thing that is interesting is with this diagnosis as it relates to physical therapy, you know, our profession and the name insinuates some sort of contact uh, or activity. And activity is usually shunned uh, by these individuals. They don't want to do activity. Um, And the component of touch, unlike most things in medicine um, or other conditions, let's say, this is a very test history heavy area to treat. Mm -hmm. Your ENT is typically maybe grabbing your ear and looking inside and that's about it. Um, You know, you do follow and do some visual tests, but the actual touch component of what we are used to doing has been lacking up until that point. And I think touch is a very powerful thing. Uh, And so if a patient is presenting with a lot of tension, uh, you can see posturally, they're just holding themselves and guarding, you know, with their movements, sometimes just ending uh, the initial session saying, hey, let's check out your neck and spend three or four minutes there, five or 10 minutes there to see if there's a contributor can really diffuse and kind of ease the the anxiety that they come in with uh and so from from a typical you know you ask what a typical typical intake looks like it's going to be listening to that story it's going to be asking lots of questions that can guide you as to where you need to test um and then seeing if you can do something to give them immediate relief i want to grab the lowest hanging fruit right away um Mm -hmm. and then from there uh i'll do a balance series of balance assessments because I want to know their true baseline. If they have a BPPB overlying some, you know, peripheral problem, other peripheral problem, then we want to actually get the real baseline. We don't want to dilute that by uh, treating the BPPB first, mm-hmm. right? So then I'll, I'll go through their oculomotor testing and their balance testing and, and then assess those things that we can get right off the bat and provide relief for. So that's, that's the typical uh, it's a lot process. of detective work. I mean, yeah. I, I remember Matt, the, when we worked together, I think I really appreciate what you said about just the listening, because I think a lot of us, Ashley, you probably know this when we go in, we have a lot of anxiety and we're just, we start to kind of have a higher baseline of anxiety because we're just used to this sensation all the time. And mm-hmm. so to have finally be listened to for an hour <laughs> yeah. is really, really comforting. So I, I feel like I, the relationship I had with my PTs 
because I went through VRT a couple of times and then I also went through one specifically for PBPD, but the relationship I had with them was much different and much closer than I had with my doctors. And I felt like they really listened to me and really changed my outlook on things. Um, I, like Matt said, like when you were saying about the working on the neck for probably the first like six months of each well the first time wasn't six months but like the last two times i did vrt we started with the neck and it really just because you're trying not to be dizzy all the time so you're putting all this tension here and i'm sure that you you see it and it just it made it so much better um and learning those techniques um and just kind of like listening and so then my husband could help me too and mine were also great where they would kind of pull my husband in and be like hey you know, you can do this at home, right. um, which was really helpful. So right. it sounds like you had, um, well, I don't know. Did you go in with expectations of what um, VRT was going to be like, Ashley? Because it sounds like you had a good experience. And um... I had no idea what was happening when I went in, <laughs> uh, to be honest. I just know I was like, I can't walk to the bathroom. So if these people are going to help me be able to even get to the bathroom without having to like hold onto a wall or crawl there, then I am up for anything. Um, and they were great. I actually, so when I said I had, I got sick the first time and then I went back to nursing and then I got sick again. Um, I went back to the same PT office because I liked them so much and they did they were so great. And they listened to me, especially because you know how a lot of times testing will come back and be like, oh, you're at like 95% of everybody. And you're like, but I still don't feel like me. Like I might be testing here, but my level, especially as an ER nurse, and I used, I was a volleyball player throughout high school, my level was like up here. So I'm like, if I'm still here, that is not, that's not me. Yeah. And that's not where I live my life on the daily. So we, I, that was my big thing and they understood that. And so they pushed me to make sure that we were not just staying at where like barely passing is where some people live, which is fine. Um, but that's just not where I lived. And so they were great about that. Awesome. Yeah. I think that the expectations is a, a big part of it. I know um, I went to a physical therapist recently and that is the first thing they ask is, you know, what are your goals and, uh, and addressing those goals and, and helping you get back to what you consider, you know, your normal or as, as close to that. And, and also maybe setting expectations for, yeah. for helping you set, reset your expectations because, you know, like for example, uh, it, uh, when I left my last physical therapy appointment, this is for a, you know, a different kind of issue, a car accident. I'm like, well, I, it'll, it'll be great to see if I can get back to a hundred percent. And he's like, mm, maybe not a hundred, yeah. you know, and, uh, and it's helpful to hear, to hear that sometimes. Um, Matt, you were, you know, you were talking about um, uh, getting the information from the other healthcare providers, you know, Ashley saw an ENT and a neurologist. How do you work with a patient's healthcare team um, in, to, to either, you know, gather information from them, share information right. with them? Um, you know, how does that work? I think, you know, the, the first thing to do is to kind of um, medicine is so time intensive uh the whole system right and so i don't i try not to pick up the phone unless i need to uh and and i i kind of let the evaluation speak for itself and if we find something a little bit differently then that's great and let's explore that because these are going to be uh time intensive treatments they're not uh short term you know if somebody comes in with a knee problem and it's diagnosed with x and i think it's y um, that might necessitate a different treatment plan immediately. With vestibular problems, you have to do a little exploration. And so this is the arena to do that exploration. Uh, the physician, the audiologist, they'll do their assessment, they'll do their diagnosis, and then we flesh it out a little bit. And, and even with the same diagnosis, with different patients, you're going to have different, different um, reactions, different responses, different 
progressions, right? So um, I try to be respectful of time. If there is an issue and we're not progressing as expected, um, first I've got to reevaluate what I'm doing. Am I missing the mark? And uh, and am I um, needing to redirect my treatment? And sometimes, as good as we think we are with our explanations, we say, hey, let's go through this again. What exactly are you doing at home? And there might be a real discrepancy between what would be ideal and what the patient is performing. And so we've got to go back and say, okay, where did I miss the mark in teaching and instructing to get a good outcome and a good home program? So that would be another another thing to evaluate um, before reaching out and taking other people's times. And then there's other conditions where other situations where, yes, you do pick up the phone and you talk to the ENT or you talk to the neurologist. Or last week I called a PCP and said, hey, um, you know, this current patient has recurrent BPPB, just cannot shake this, shake this loose. The opposite of that, can't stabilize <laughs> yeah. this. Um, and can we look at vitamin D levels? Because some of the recommendations and the research out there says, hey, if you've got a really low threshold of vitamin D, you need to maybe look at supplementing and, and utilizing calcium uh, to aid the absorption so that you can maybe influence that recurrence. And, and ah. so that data is out there. So, so that was great. I, I didn't have to um, bother a specialist. Uh, and the primary care said, yeah, send me, send me what you got. And so I, I emailed a few articles over to them and the patient went in and they're doing follow up now. So, um, I think, you know, avoid the paper pushing, uh, pick up the phone when warranted and make sure you've done your, your homework prior to taking other people's time. Yeah. So it sounds like you're doing a couple of things. One is, um, evaluating when, um, you know, what you, what might be best for the patient isn't within your scope of practice and right. referring them then to the appropriate other healthcare provider, such as the primary care provider for right. evaluation of vitamin D levels. Um, and, and also, um, here's a, a question. If you had a patient, for example, that came in with a, a BPPV diagnosis and you do an evaluation and you're like this, I, I don't think this is what it is. I think that they might have something else. Would you then refer them back to a specialist for, to be reevaluated and, and uh, maybe get a different diagnosis? Um, maybe not right away. Um, I'm going to treat what I see. You know, luckily in, in the state of Oregon, people can walk in the door and say, Hey, I'm dizzy. Uh, and I, you know, I don't, hope to see those, but sometimes people walk in and say, I have BPBB, can you help me? And, and we check and they're like, yeah, you have BPBB, there's, you know, you do a neurologic screen, you make sure there's nothing else emergent potentially, because that's dizziness is not, you know, uh, it can cover a lot of ground and you have to be, be safe with that. But um, I, I will treat and, and, and if I know what it is, or I feel like, okay, yeah, maybe it's not a BPPB. Maybe you have something that is mimicking this uh, and it's a vestibular problem. I'll go ahead and initiate that treatment and certainly inform the, the referring provider as such. Um, but um, I guess I'm not so dependent on a provider's diagnosis as what can I do for the patient right now? Where can we go mm -hmm. and get on the road to recovery? Um, because a, a change in a in a name of something on paper is not going to help them. Um, and yeah. I think that's, that's a, kind of the, everybody's looking for the label, right? What is the problem? What do I have? Um, and somebody, you know, actually got labyrinthitis, which sounds like may or may not have been the case um, at that moment in time. So mm -hmm. uh, what can I do to help them? Uh, and, and going back to your original question about referring out, I think, that intake process, that patient rapport, that therapeutic alliance, you can start also having conversations about um, getting things like anxiety addressed and getting life stressors that may be contributing and stacking onto their problem that amplify it, getting that addressed. And it's very, um, that can be a very sensitive conversation for some people 
um, like, oh, you think this is, you know, I'm causing this or you think it's in my head. And it's like, no, no, here's how this, <laughs> here's how these things work together and, and amplify each other. So uh, being able to, to have that conversation as um, in a way that makes them feel comfortable and spurs them to action as opposed to um, maybe makes them a little bit more defensive. Um, yeah. because when you talk about that component of care, um, that is perceived sometimes by patients as instead of th something that's wrong with, with my body is something that's wrong with me. And mm -hmm. that's a different conversation. And so I think you have yeah. to, to tread lightly, you know, over time, uh, it, you know, in certainly in the time I've been practicing, that is not so sensitive. Uh, and so we're a little bit more open to discussing those things and, and being open to addressing them. Uh, but I still think you have to be careful uh, in how you, yeah. how you approach. But, but when you address it, um, it can have a, a wonderful benefit uh, and complement to making them feel better. Yeah, Matt, we're all nodding our heads. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate a couple different things you shared, but I want to, um, especially it's just your approach is patient centered instead of insurance centered. The fact that you would, you know, defer going back to the PCP to get the diagnosis, delay the process, tell, send the patient home without any treatment, and instead just look at them and say, hey, let's address right now what I feel I can help you with, you know? And I think that's just such a, that's a, that is dem demonstrative of your understanding of the suffering that that patient is walking into your clinic with. They want help. Right, right. <laughs> so, but now, so Ashley, I want to turn it over to you because what happens, and I know many of us have had this experience too with VRT, mm -hmm. uh, you, you had some good things happen. Did you have anything that didn't work? Um, so I will say, I want to say there wasn't really much that didn't work. My PTs were really good about trying to hit the like correct spots for me that I needed. They were also really good at identifying when they couldn't help me um, as much as they could, as much as I needed. So for instance, my PT realized when I told him, I was like, when I look at the stairs, the stairs don't look like, I can't judge the distance between them. They all look like one. Um, when I'm walking up them and he was, and I mean, we were doing eye exercises. We were, I was twisting my head many, many times a day. <laughs> um, and he sent me to the vision therapist and I didn't even know that vision therapy was a thing until then. And that's when I started. And then when I moved, I continued. Um, and it's because of my original PT that told me that I should go was because is now where I am today. Um, so I feel like nothing he did didn't work. I feel like a lot of things that he and, um, and a couple of my other therapists, they all did together helped me get where I am. I don't think it was just one thing. I think VRT for me was a stepping stone into being able to accept the extra therapy that was coming afterward. Um, for instance, as I said, vision therapy. Um, but I also ended up doing driving therapy, like um, out, occupational outpatient driving therapy. Um, and I would not have been able to handle that without my VRT. Um, and so, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's a, a really great uh, example and description of, you know, it's, it's not about what works and what doesn't work. It's that VRT is meant for certain things, but it's not going to fix everything. And yeah. you sought out and were, uh, were directed to other avenues to, to look at, deal with it holistically. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, how, I'm, I have kind of two questions in one for you. How, the first question is, how do you deal with a uh, a patient who isn't achieving their goals um, and or how do you look at patients who um, maybe VRT isn't what they need or isn't all of what they need? Right. Um, so going back to to um, what I said before about evaluating what we're doing 
and how we're doing it, right? And are we doing it right? And are are the patients doing it right? Are they are their expectations uh, correct? And are they implementing correctly? If we kind of cover all those bases and check those boxes, um, it goes also back to what I said initially: not to shun the diagnosis, but but uh, because I want to help them right away but to make sure that you are pulling in and going back to your provider or referring to an appropriate provider to say, hey, can you please reevaluate or picking up the phone and talking to the ENT that referred and say, look, this is not responding as such. I had a, I recall a patient that came to me with um, a presumed, um, I can't remember if it was a, a labyrinthitis that they were presumably getting over, um, or if it was BPPV, but, but she ended up having 3PD. And so, you know, we're doing all this stuff and it's just like, mm, this isn't quite, this isn't quite lining up. Um, and, and so we were able to give them some strategies. We were able to give them some things that would help with some, some, some matter of sensory inputs with some vestibular or some visual inputs um, and, and dissuade some of those symptoms. But also dig down and figure out, you know, this person was under stress and they just kind of said, well, this is my life. And that stress component was not even acknowledged to need to be addressed. And, and then when we said, well, let's look at what's going on here, you know, multiple moves, multiple jobs in, in these short time frames, and, and kind of recurring, recurring things that you look at any psychology book that says these are major life stressors this person was having it every three months sort of thing and then they're kind of wondering why do i you know have this this problem and so oh okay let's let's address it now from a 3pd standpoint and let's get um psych involved and let's look at maybe some medication complements that really made a huge difference for this person um so you've got to be able to look at the diagnosis look at what's what's what the patient is responding to and then open have a broad scope as well to say which direction do we need to go uh, and sometimes getting help with that um, from the specialists and maybe even more testing that that hasn't been performed up to date up to that point in time is it safe to say matt that generally the central vestibular disorders don't respond to vrt classic vrt i think classic um i i, I guess i would also add that, that um, without getting too much in the weeds on this, the, you know, the nervous system, uh, you look at something like multiple sclerosis, those folks are going to have dizziness. Um, you look at some stroke patients, they're going to have dizziness. And so there's different, different approaches to help with those conditions that may not fall within the, the classic VRT bucket um but that you can certainly help them uh overcome or improve um hmm. so so it's not maybe as clear cut but as by definition yes central this vestibular problems aren't going to be as as responsive to a traditional brt approach uh, but those yeah. overlap heavily with other other neurologic conditions so i don't think we can totally hmm. exclude the benefit yeah yeah i, I remember you Oh, I was just going to say, I remember you giving me a couple VRT exercises early on. And I was like, these actually make me feel better right away because of the, the MDDS and the motion that helped always helped me. And so that was right. you, you couldn't get a baseline with me because I was like, no, this isn't making me dizzier. This is making me feel better right, right. away. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes um, the, Jeffrey Maitland is a he's an orthopedist, Australian based therapist that um, is uh, kind of established a, a baseline of treatment and a certain paradigm. Uh, and one of the things I recall him teaching was always believe the patient. And so mm -hmm. taking, taking Kim, you know, your example where you say, Hey, look, I have MDDS um, and I've got these other symptoms that are going on. I'm, I'm going to actually take that at face value. Right. Um, but I'm also going to try to prove myself wrong and maybe prove you wrong and mm -hmm. confirm. Right. Because again, if we go with just purely diagnoses, we might be missing the boat 
on some things that we can help you with. Um, and so, so I'm still going to go through the, through the, the protocol per se. I still want to be thorough with the assessment. And if we do a little thing that you go, oh, wow, th yeah, that didn't make it worse. That helped. Well, then that's a tool for you yeah. to maybe implement down the road. Uh, yeah. so that it just makes, you know, 5% better, 2% better, 10% better. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Go ahead, Ashley. I was going to say, Matt, do you ever, do you ever see patients who actually know what vestibular things are when they come in to see you? Or is it like a whole other world? Like, cause when I got sick, I had no, I like, even as an ER nurse, I, I know a little bit of everything, but I don't know a lot of like one center thing. Mm. So when I went in and they were like, oh, it's, you know, your vestibular system, I'm like, okay, I've heard of that, but I don't, I don't know what all this is. I know it helps my balance, but that's all I got. So right. Do you ever have like patients that say like, I actually know what vestibular is, or do they usually come in kind of uneducated and need, need that? Right, right. Well, I think, you know, gone are the days of the all knowing medical provider right you know patients yeah. are very very empowered and you know thanks to websites like veda you get tons of information at your fingertips um and and so that i think that's actually a good thing it helps it helps accelerate the conversation it helps accelerate you know getting where we need to go and mm -hmm. and maybe can truncate a little bit of that educational process um mm -hmm. But then, of course, there are some that come in and they're like, okay, you know, and we go through this, this chart <laughs> behind yeah. me and, and we, we kind of talk through it. And, um, and so you, it is an educational process, but I think it's, it's actually favorable that patients come in with some knowledge and information um, because it helps you get on the same page faster. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like. I remember when it like all first started and I remember finding like Alicia with Dizzy Cook and I found Marina with Parenting with Migraine and a lot of other people who are, I was like, okay, like they've had similar things happen to me, but it's nice to pull from different like everyday people and be like, right. oh, you, right. you look like me. Like you didn't have a giant accident where things just like something traumatic happened. You just up and walked out one day and this happened. So I was just curious. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the social media, um, there's a there's a benefit and there's a little bit of a curse, I think, with that, but uh, there's a bit of support uh, that can be recognized, um, you know, 20 years ago, you didn't have that. And you probably felt like you were much more of an island. Uh, yeah. when you ran into these problems. And so being able to recognize, oh, okay, yeah, they're, they're, I'm not the only one. And, and you know, Kim, your unfixed series um, is, you know, very, a very good illustration of how that, how that can actually be embraced and help people in many ways, um, not just on yeah. their technical vestibular side. But um, yeah, I think, uh, Finding those resources, there's so many available, it's hard to even start that list. Um, I'd say start at beta and go from there. Yeah. Yeah. You both talked about lifestyle changes. And I think that that, you know, when I look at our communities, our peer support communities, I think that's a, a big part of what what people gain from that. They, they gain validation, number one, as you were saying, Ashley, that they're not alone. They're not the only person this is happening to. And they can also share, you know, this, you know, I, I tried this little thing, you know, and it worked for me, which is, you know, when you go to a medical provider, they're going to present you with what they've learned and what is evidence-based and supported, which is completely appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, but it also is just about figuring out what works for you in your life um, and sharing those little those little things, you know, like um, uh, uh, like meditation, for example, or, um, you know, other stress uh, relieving practices. Like yeah. what when we were talking about it, I think it was last week um, when we were talking about would we avoid things or like lifestyle changes. And I remember being like, I can't do this and being upset about it, but then being able to see other people who once were where I, where I was and then 
for a while, it wasn't like, oh, I have to avoid this all the time. It's right now my body can't handle this. So with that fact, maybe later it can. And, and that was a good, and my PTs were very, my PTs were very good at making sure that I understood that as well, that it's not a forever thing. And that, you know, some of these changes are going to be just right now. And then we can kind of scoot along as we go up and then you could be able to handle more. And that's yeah. basically good to also know. I think, I think, like, yeah. I think, you know, looking at what you just said, um, when you incorporate that component into a vestibular rehab program, uh, it, it really makes it more effective. Uh, it sounds like you were a very active person. You know, you played volleyball and, and now all of a sudden maybe you cut back on your physical activity. Uh, yes. and so you're, you're limited there and there's, you know, ask any runner that can't run because they have an injury there, there it's way beyond just, oh, I'm not running. Uh, yeah. right. So I think you can take that same, you have to take that same consideration when you're, talking to people and talking to patients, you know, as providers, um, do you have three kids that you've got to run around to soccer practice? Do you have a job that is, you know, visually, physically demanding that for us to say, oh, you need to implement your, your, your BRT exercises four times a day in order to get the gain? Well, they may be just overwhelmed in their environment. And so trying to pick that apart and say, okay, do we really need to make a lifestyle change here? Um, or maybe those that are more sedentary that we know, hey, a little physical activity is going to go a long way in complementing what you're trying to do. And that is wake up the system again um, and encouraging them to make a change there. So, you know, that's the luxury we have as PTs is to kind of get in the weeds on that. Um, whereas when you get a diagnosis and you walk out of the audiologist's office um, or the neurologist's office, you, you haven't had that conversation. And so now you're trying to figure out how to put it all together. Um, yeah. It's such a holistic approach and it, it's just, it's invaluable. Ashley, it sounds like you're in really good hands with your PTs. I know I was in good hands with you, Matt. And it's, you know, and I think in general, PTs are trained with to have an eye for that larger story of what the patient is walking in with. Yeah. It's a, this is such a huge topic. I, I have so many other, everything that each of you has said, I can think of a million other questions to ask, but I want to, um, I want to just wrap it up by asking each of you if you could share, and we'll start with you, Ashley, you know, what would you say to someone who is just starting, who's been just referred to physical therapy, um, either they don't know what's going on, they're starting, maybe they're not getting the, the gains that they're hoping for immediately. What would you say to encourage them to, you know, continue? Um, so honestly, I would start with saying that, saying that this is not forever. This is today. Um, and I always tell myself that when I have really hard migraine days too, or just really hard PPP days where I just the like the floor wants to move and I have to use a wall. Um, but I would say, I mean, I also, t I tell myself you've done hard things already. Like, so you can do this, like you've already done the toughest part. So you can definitely do the next thing that's happening right now. Um, and I would also tell them that it's okay to not know what's happening right now, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be that way forever. And that your team that you're going to have is going to change. You're going to have VRT. You may be a person who needs vision therapy. You might need to be a person who needs to go to occupational therapy and relearn how to do things. Um, and that doesn't devalue you. It doesn't devalue anything you once did or that you can do later. Um, it's in that moment and you're trying to just get to the next one. Um, and I would also definitely encourage, um, like Matt had said, with the anxiety component, um, therapy, uh, CBT, which is, I'm having brain fog, so I don't remember. Cognitive, cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy. therapy. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, CBT, 
was great. I would, I, I think that everyone should have a therapist, but um, definitely vestibular patients, just even to just check in. Um, and I really think that that will help your mindset so that you can take in all this stuff that's happening because it's a lifestyle change. Um, really just depending on which diagnosis you end up getting, whatever label it is, but yeah. Thank you. Matt, yeah. do you have a, a little nugget of wisdom? Well, I think, you know, VRT is in vestibular problems are one area where, um, very few times would I say you have to get worse to get better. In other words, you mm -hmm. have to challenge yourself. And so you have to expect that this is going to be a little uncomfortable, but in a very controlled, deliberate, objective way. Um, yeah. And the other is just understand that medicine, practicing medicine is a term that gets thrown around. But if you think about it, um, it's really applicable. Uh, we don't have it all figured out. We don't know all the information, not all the data is in. And so these things that we um, have constructed are based on the best information possible. Every patient is different. Uh, and we may have actually gotten it wrong. Um, now, I wouldn't say that out front, but if you want to set the tone that this is not the ultimate solution, um, we're going to do our best. We're going to help you. And here's why we think you're going to get better. And here's where we need your help. Uh, to making sure that we're on the same page as we go through this process. Um, and if you can kind of lay the land there that we're in this together and, and it's not, I know, and I'm going to tell you, but we're going to work together and I need your feedback, then you're setting yourself up for a better, a better outcome. Amazing. And I would add, if you don't have that position or care, care provider that's saying, um, I'm part of your team, I have your back, and they're instead saying, I know what the answers are, find someone new. <laughs> so hunt around until you have somebody that you can really feel heard, you intuitively in your gut, you know that this person may not have all the answers, but they're there with you to, mm -hmm. to do the detective work. You know, they're out there. You just gotta keep searching. Go to Vita's website, find them there. <laughs> Well, thank you both for sharing your, uh, your experience and your expertise on this subject that is uh, one of the, the top things that vestibular patients that come to Vita ask us about. So um, we'll, we're going we're gonna to have to continue this conversation again later. But yeah, thank, you, thank you both again yeah. for yeah. taking the time today and sharing with the vestibular community. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to ICU this month. We hope this conversation sparked new understanding of the vestibular journey. And for all of our patients out there, leaves you feeling just a little more heard and a little more seen. I see you.